in prayer. Um, the scripture today that I felt called to read uh, to you comes from Matthew 7. This is from the Sermon of the Mount. And it starts in verse 7, Matthew 7, 7. It says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who also receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. This is Jesus' words telling us that if we ask for it in, in God's will, for God's glory, it will be given to us. Jerry, will you come up in us in prayer? If you would, go ahead and stand with me. Let's prepare our hearts for the service today. If you would, please bow. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for the wonderful day you've given us. We thank you for this opportunity to come and to worship you, Lord, to be with our brothers and sisters. But Lord, we want to feel your presence. Lord, we ask that you remove any hindrance that we may have. We ask that the Spirit will speak to each of us. We ask that the message will be heard, that there will be a special message for each and every one of us. Lord, we pray this in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. How we need the Lord today, in a big way. Uh, if you don't see that today, let me encourage you, watch your TV. You can't believe everything in the media now. And you can't believe everything on Facebook either. But I believe there's enough out there to cause concern. We're in a bad way today. In a country. In a society. And it's not really found in a presidential candidate. It's not found in the White House or the Congress or the Senate or the state. In our leaders. Although we pray for godly men and women to rise up and stand up and do what's right. And I hope we will support those that do. It's found in the person of Jesus Christ today. Him and him alone. Jesus is the answer, as the old song says, for the world today. Above him there's no other, for Jesus is the way. Amen? Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me this morning to the book of 1 Kings chapter 19. In the Old Testament, 1 Kings... Chapter 19. Again, it's a privilege for us to be with you today. Um, we're saddened that Brother Don has uh, moved on, but we're excited. When God opens doors, uh, we don't always understand. Sometimes we do understand. But when God's leading and prompting, we need to be faithful to follow and to do what he's beckoned us to do. So we pray for Brother Don and Carla and their new venture and uh, pray God's blessings upon them and uh, God has the right person to lead this church. So I hope you'll be praying for that as well. 1 Kings chapter 19, if you'll stand for the reading of God's word this morning, we'll start there in verse 1. It says that Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah has done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent messengers to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, it's enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father. And as he lay and slept under the juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Rise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither to a cave, and he lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, slain the prophets with the sword. And I, even only I, 
him left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle, went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I've been a very jealous for the Lord God of the hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, slain the prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left that they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elijah, the son of Shaphat, of Abimeloah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Haziel shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this reading and your anointing upon it today and upon the messenger. God, as you've uh, led me to bring this today, that God, you will help. Lord, we stand here not in our power and our strength, but Lord, yours and yours alone. So I pray that you're honored and glorified in the effort today. That as we lift you up and continue to do so in word and in song, that Father, you'll draw all men to yourself. So thank you, Lord, for this privilege today to stand in this pulpit. Thank you for the freedom we have to come as worshipers today. And may we respond to the call that you're bringing forth to every person in this room today. Thank you for your love. I pray that if there's be one here today who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, and they will invite you to be their Lord and Savior before they leave today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Again, this is a very discouraging day, I guess, uh, seeing the way things in our country, the way they're going. Uh, even as Christians, there are a lot of things happening in, in the church realm, I guess, that could be considered discouraging. Um, I'm not going to go into that. That's another sermon in itself. But, you know, when we're promised an abundant life in Christ, we're not promised an easygoing life, are we? Uh, there are going to be troubles and trials that come along our way. It's not going to be carefree and easy just because we, we have the Lord uh, as our Lord and Savior. He said there'll be temptations, there'll, there'll be troubles, there'll be trials, and he warned against it and how we're to defend ourselves and not be discouraged by it. This was certainly the case in Elijah's situation here. He had come through many great victories where he had seen God move in various ways. And if you go back into verse here in chapter 17, you see where Elijah's introduced to us uh, and he goes to King Ahab and he proclaims that there's going to be no rain. Uh, because of the wickedness that the king uh, had displayed and because of what he was leading the uh, Israelites uh, into doing and be, in being the poor example that he was to them. Um, and he goes to announce, God's going to withhold rain for three years. God's going to withhold, you won't have. And so he goes and, and delivers the message. And uh, later on, he sends him afterwards to the brook Kareth, uh, to I guess to, to be refreshed and renewed and encouraged and to wait for the word of the Lord where the Bible says he stayed there. He was watered by the brook. He was fed by the ravens that came and brought him food. And, and then God sends him on his way. And uh, as he journeys next to a widow woman uh, who's on the verge of starvation and uh, as he deals with her and and prays with her and helps her uh, the, the last little bit that she was to fix for her and her son before they died because everything was, was gone because of the drought, because of the no rain. Uh, Elijah says, do this, make me a little cake first. And they ate for several days with nothing going bare. Uh, the, the oil did not fail, the, the meal did not fail, and they were able to eat and be sustained. This widow woman's son... Uh, became very sick 
And um, Elijah prays to God to heal him, and God raises him back from the dead. Uh, we see God going back to Ahab, sending him back to Ahab, challenging the prophets of Baal. Uh, and you know the story of, about the, on the Mount Carmel, uh, where he challenged the 800 so uh, prophets, and uh, they danced and they hollered and they cut themselves with knives and, and cried out to their gods and and went on and on and on until Elijah rebuilds the altar and he pours water on it and he offers a sacrifice and the fire from heaven fell and consumed the sacrifice, the altar, the water and everything around it, demonstrating his power unto the people, declaring him the Lord, he is God. But you know, after that, after he's seen victory after victory after victory after victory, he did not see God withhold his hand. He did not see any absence of a display of power in any form or fashion. God did exactly what he said he was going to do. But he comes to a place now where Jezebel gets word of all that's happened, all the prophets that were slain. And she says, I'm going to do the same to you and much more so. So he runs and he hides and, and he, he goes under a juniper tree and he's asking the Lord, just let me die. You ever get to that place? You get thing, you get the pressures of life and they seem to overtake and overwhelm you. And you, you kind of question the Lord, Lord, what's going on in my life? Why is this happening? Just let me die. Just take my life. I'd be better off dead, basically is what Elijah is saying. I'd be better off dead than than out here running from this wicked woman and, and dealing with the pressures of life. And it doesn't matter everything that I do. I keep doing what you call me to do. And, and is it really making any difference? You've been there, haven't you? Sure you have. I have. I know uh, Karen's daddy, he was a pastor, pastored in our home church back in Brownwood for 44 years. And I don't know, he's told me several times, he said, I fired myself many a times after Sunday services because I thought I'd done so poorly. He said, only to wake up on Monday morning and hire myself again. See, there are times when we get a little discouraged. There are times we get a little despondent. There are times that we have those moments of weakness and failure. I know there have been times I've led a song service and I thought I just flopped. But I'd have people come up afterwards and say, that was a wonderful song you sang, or that was a wonderful message that you shared. And, and, and sometimes they just say uh, those things, and I just, okay, you're just being nice. But there are times when they would say, I like the part what you said about, and I don't ever remember saying it. That's just the spirit of the Lord taking over, taking our weaknesses and making something of them. Speaking on our behalf, in spite of our faults and in our failures. Well, in Elijah's case, God leads him to a place and proposes this question. So when he's out here in this wilderness and he's laying under this juniper tree, feeling sorry for himself, he comes to him and he says, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And that's my question to you this morning. What are you doing here? Well, my wife made me come. And the kids would say, well, my mom and dad made me come. Somebody brought me here. Somebody told me so. Well, this is always what I do on Sunday. But why are you here? As we see in Elijah's example this morning, there are some things I'll just point out briefly today. First of all, that hard times respect no one. Hard situations and circumstances in life respect no one. Life happens to all of us. Every one of us will have a moment of weakness. Every moment will have, everyone will have a moment of uncertainty. Everyone will have some difficulty. Even pastors, Sunday school teachers, workers. And thank God for you nursery people. Probably the most unappreciated position in the church, but thank you for those who are willing to work. Every Christian has felt like they're the only ones that may be living for God. I'm the only one that's doing this job. I'm the only one that's witnessing. I'm the only one that's serving. I'm the, y'all ever get there? 
So everyone has a moment, and then everyone has a moment of intense ministry. You're, you're at it, and you're working constantly. And it takes a toll. If we begin to look at ourselves, and we begin to rely upon our own strengths and, and our own abilities, we begin depending on those things instead of relying on the source of our strength, and that being God. See, He's the giver, and, and He's the one that makes the opportunities possible, and He opens the doors for us, and, and He presents the desire to us, and we're, if we're faithful and obedient, we'll step out in faith and say, yes, Lord, I will do that. And He may capitalize on your abilities that He's given you, but He also may give you untold resource to be able to fulfill the task. And I believe He will. It's a physical and emotional exhaustion that we face when we work in our own strength. When we become physically and emotionally beat down, if you will, it clouds our judgment. When our judgment gets clouded, then we become impatient. When we become impatient, it leads us to disobedience. When disobedience creeps up, then it leads to loneliness and discouragement, which brings us to despondency. We don't react much anymore. A state of depression, if you will. And it's easy when our eyes, again, are focused on us. We're in that I society. I phones, I pads, I this, I that. And sometimes that leads us to a place where we like to have our own pity parties, right? I heard a preacher say once, it's okay to have a pity party. Be on the pity pot every now and then, but just make sure you flush when you're done. <laughs> I know as preachers, we, get, we take things seriously, especially when we preach a message and we have an opportunity to minister and we expect great results and we should. I mean, we shouldn't preach or we shouldn't do anything in ministry thinking nothing's going to come of it. That nobody's life will be changed. That nobody will receive the Lord as their Savior. That nobody will come do business. And that our expectations ought to be high. That it ought to be, thy will be done, not mine. But it's easy to become discouraged. I know when I started preaching, I expected the altars to be flooded. I expected the aisles, to, you know, people fill the aisles to come forward. I expected this great move and work of God and it didn't come. And I thought, my, ter- my, my preaching is just terrible. But I've heard other preachers say the same thing. So I learned to take heart. It's not my preaching. It's the Spirit drawing people to Himself. And we can't be discouraged and blame ourselves for those who have a rebellious spirit against God. We can't blame ourselves for those who have an unrepentant heart. We can't blame ourselves for those who don't want to change. We can't blame ourselves for those who hear, but they don't heed. And just like Elijah, we can't consider ourselves better than our fathers. We just have to be faithful and obedient. We like to compare ourselves to other people. I wish I was like that person. Or, or, or they may be great and, and Hopefully you have influences and people that have impacted your life to encourage you. But we think, I can't be as good as that person. I can't be that great. I can't do this. I can't. And we tell ourselves we can't. And if you're like my mom or daddy or some of my teachers, uh, they'd give us a whipping if we, if we said we can't. I think God would have beat us down by now. <laughs> we tell the Lord we can't. And be careful what you tell the Lord what you can and can't do or won't do because he has a great sense of humor and he will lead you to the things you said you'd never do. And that could be a good thing as long as God's in it. So we know that hard times respect no one. We know also that hard times evoke God's hand for everyone needs to have a time of refreshment we go and we go and we go and we get to a place and say, I need a vacation. I need a break. And that's not a bad thing. 
that's a good thing. We need to have times of refreshment. We need to have times when we take a step back and say, all right, Lord, fill me again because I got, a, I got another round to go. We need times we just let our, our minds clear a bit. And we listen for the still, small voice. There's so many noises out in the world today that bombard us on a daily basis. As I mentioned, we, were, we lived in Brownwood for a good while. In fact, Brother Don and I, uh, I didn't know it, but uh, we served in the same association years ago. I was in Anson, Texas, and he was in a little community of Hawley, just outside of there, just a few miles. So I didn't really realize that we got to catching up one day and start talking about those things. But there's such a difference in the West Texas mindset and this mindset. And that's one of the things I told God I'd never do. I'd never go to the Metroplex. I'd never move to Dallas. I told you God has a great sense of humor. But there's such a difference. You can go out to West Texas and you feel just at ease. Your, your guard immediately goes down and there's just kind of a calm that comes over you. Anytime we get to the Dallas city limits, Fort Worth, Dallas, I mean, the, the, the hairs begin to raise on the back of my head and my neck. And uh, it's just... So tense. But I love going back out to West Texas because it's just a calm. I mean, people just are so easy going out there and they just love everything and everybody and nothing, nothing worries them much out there. But God knows how we need to be refreshed. We need that sense of ease and calm and we need a time just to step back and let him speak to us. Note that he always cares for your need. We don't always realize what we need in life until we get there. And sometimes it takes a certain situation or trial or tribulation to kind of get our attention and say, you know, I need a break. But we don't always know how or when. But God's going to come through to meet that need. God's going to bring you to a place where you're looking at Him. I remember the old song that said, sometimes we have to be knocked down. To make us look upward. Amen. Sometimes we have to be knocked down. Sometimes we have to be beat down. Sometimes we get worn down. But it makes us look upward to say God I need you. As that song we just sang a moment ago. But note that when God comes to us. It will be refreshing. And whatever he gives us will be enough to meet the need. Just like in Elijah's case. When he was at the brook Kareth. He was watered, and the ravens fed him. And then when he was hiding in, in, in the wilderness there under the juniper tree, an angel came and fed him. And God sustained him. God helped him, as he will help you too. So everyone needs times of refreshment. Everyone also needs to be reminded that God will show us how selfish we really are. We sing the old song, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. But Elijah started looking at what he had done. Lord, I've done all this work for you. I've done everything you've told me to do. Am I the only one doing anything? Note that it's not about you. Again, it's about your faithful, your faithfulness and obedience in fulfilling the call that was placed on your life. Note that God has many tools at his bidding as he demonstrated to Elijah, as he told him. I mean, he came, uh, he allowed the strong winds to blow and he, he had the earthquake and the fire, but he wasn't speaking through those things. I think he was just getting Elijah's attention. When uh, the dust had settled and when the calm had come, there was a still small voice calling out to Elijah. For the second time, Elijah, what are you doing here? What's your purpose in being here? God may not always work in the same way every time. Because he had a purpose and he had a plan for Elijah. Not only through the things that he had already accomplished, but he said, I need you to go from this place now and I need you to anoint two kings. And then I need you to go anoint another prophet. So he wasn't done with Elijah. 
He had a purpose and a plan, just like he does for you and for I. He has a purpose and a plan for each one of us in this room today, and it's going to be up to us if we're going to fulfill it or not. Well, I can't do that. Don't ever tell God you can't. If God gives you a burden and God gives you a desire, you need to step out in faith and say, yes, Lord. And then you'll be amazed if you'll turn the situation over to him and allow his spirit to work through you. The problem with a lot of people who have failed the Lord is that they're trying to work in their own power. They're trying to do it their way, in their own strength. Instead of seeking the Lord, asking for his direction, asking for his strength in their life. It's not for us to dictate what methods God's going to use. It's going to be different for everybody. But we try to copycat everybody else. We can be encouraged by what God has done. We can be encouraged by their example. We can be encouraged by their work. But we ought not duplicate it. God has a direction and a purpose and a plan for everyone. And in everything in life, in the things that surround us, the big, the loud, the miraculous displays that tend to get our attention, but the still small voice is what makes a difference. I would say it's not just in the world. There are a lot of things in the church realm today too that are big and boisterous and catch our attention. But the matter of the fact is God's not in them. We've chosen to do things our own way. We've created our own devices. We've Christianized a lot of things, calling it godly. We need to get back to the simple truths of the word of God. We need to let his word be the standard. We ought not compromise it. We not say it's archaic, it's outdated, it doesn't apply to us anymore. No, God's word is still the same. Yesterday, today, and forevermore will be. And according to what my Bible says, his word endures forever. So the opinions and the ways of the world are ever changing. They're like the shifting sands. They're going to be different tomorrow than they were today. But God's word never changes. This is the truth we build our lives on. This is, this is what we live our lives by. When you have a firm foundation in life and you declare the truth of the word of God as to be the absolute truth, you gauge everything else by it. That's one thing that's happening in society today. We're redefining terms. We're redefining uh, the questions. We're redefining everything else around us because people don't like the answers they're getting now. Instead of calling what's right, right, and what's wrong, wrong, we're kind of looking for the gray matter, the in-between. So what do you mean, Brother Mike? Well, if you can't tell the difference between a boy and a girl, take out your biology book from school. That will help you some. But you want a better definition? Pick up your Bible. And read in Genesis where God created male and female. See, there are absolutes that we have to live our life by. And those other voices that are drowning out Christianity and drowning out the church, we need to be listening for that still small voice. Then lastly, hard times don't alter God's plan. God, as I said, has a plan for each and every person. He asked Elijah twice for a justifiable cause for his concerns. And God's response to Elijah's despondency was return and get back to what I've called you to do. I need you to look upon your purpose and calling in life, what I've called and placed upon your life. I need you to look toward those things. I need you to be faithful and obedient to what I've asked of you. 
We'll give our situations to God. He'll work out all the details. God has other believers when we think we're the only ones. <laughs> he reminds Elijah, I've got 7,000 who have not bowed a knee to Baal. I've got others besides you that I've asked to help me, but you're one of my tools. You're one of the people I choose to use amongst many. So don't think the world revolves around you. But we never know who may be out there in the work to assist. We never know how much good our work has done. And if we will wait for God's word to us and not run in the face of opposition and failure, he will give us the encouragement we need. He will equip you. He will sustain you. He will encourage you. And he will send somebody your way to encourage you in the work. And church, that's what our purpose is as a body. To encourage each other in the work. And there's a great work to be done. It's not up to this person or that person that the work gets done. It's up to all of us that the work gets done. Amen? If you say, I don't have a purpose. I don't know what I'm doing. You need to ask God. To show you. God, what would you have me do? What is my purpose? Well, you can go to the book of 1 Corinthians. Or 2 Corinthians. When we are called to be an ambassador for Christ. Be a witness. Be an example. Be an encourager. Be a helper. If nothing else, see if somebody needs help with the work. And encourage them. But God has a purpose and plan for all of us. And if we'll wait for God's word to come to us and not run in the face of opposition, he will encourage us. So again, church, what are we doing here? I came to worship today. I came to seek the Lord today. I came to listen to the word be proclaimed today. I came to encourage a brother and sister in Christ today. I came that God would be honored today. What's your purpose? Are we fulfilling that purpose or are we hiding from the face of adversity? Are we progressing in our walk with the Lord or are we regretting our past failure? As I'm reminded of another song, it says, as I look back on all the victories, God's spirit rises up in me. And it's through the fire, my weakness, it's made strong. Let me encourage you to be refreshed in his spirit today. Return to the work. If you're here today and you don't know the Lord, that's your first step to be acquainted with him, not just in, the, in your head, but in your heart. Open your heart's door to him that he may establish a relationship with you and you seek him. And ask for his help and his guidance in all that you do. If you're a Christian here today, maybe you've kind of stepped away. Maybe you're sitting by the brook and you've been there a while. Don't camp there, be refreshed there and get about your business. Maybe you just need to reconnect with the Lord. Say, Lord, here I am. What can I do? How can you use me? Lord, you called me to do this, to serve this church, to, to serve my community, to serve my neighbors, to serve my family. Help me get about your business. But I pray that we know our purpose in life as believers in Christ. And that we'll be encouraged by him. Every time we meet together in this place, we ought to be encouraged. Every time we encounter one another, we ought to be encouraged. And when the times get tough, I pray we'll seek the Lord. Knowing that he will sustain us and help us in all that we do. Would you stand and bow with me as we pray? As we enter this time of invitation this morning, I pray that you'll ask yourself, what am I doing here today? 
Know that God has purposed for you to be here in this place. It's not by accident that he's led you here today to this house of worship. Maybe you need to open your heart for the first time and say yes to him. And not just go through the motions, but really mean it in your heart. Lord, I need you. I need you. I need to know your forgiveness. I need to know your love. I need to know what real peace is. When the world bombard me with everything else, I need to know what peace is. If you've never done so, I invite you to come join me at the front. Let me pray with you. Some of you may be burdened this morning. You may be heavy hearted. You may be despondent. These altars are open for you to come and pray and just lay it at the feet of Jesus. Lord, I need you today. I need refreshment. I need encouragement. I need help. Know that he's here to meet you. Whatever the need. Father, we give you this time. We thank you, Lord, for the challenge of the word today. For the example of Elijah. Who witnessed many great things in the power of God. But yet who also, like we, were, were frail and human. And in our moments of weakness, just like he did, we... We seek you out. Lord, help me. I'm at the place I, I just want to die. I'm no better than my fathers. God, it's in those times and in those moments you speak to us. I, expect, I pray that you're speaking now, drawing us to yourself. I'm here. I'm here. And I will help you. Lord, if there's one here today who's never acknowledged a need for you, I pray that they will. Lord, we need you in so many ways. They may not even realize. But in this wicked world we live in, we need stability. We need strength. We need encouragement that can only come from you. So whatever the need today for salvation, to reconnect with you, for help, for healing, Help us seek you out right now. In your name we pray. Amen. If God's calling you to come. I want you to meet me here at the front. Let me pray with you and introduce you to him. And we'll be done in just a moment. But you respond as God calls you. Amen. Do we have another word of announcement before we're dismissed? Okay. If you have any questions, go see him. <laughs> Again, it's been a pleasure to be with you on this Sunday. We pray the Lord's blessings upon each and every one of you today. And uh, let's just go rejoicing. Father, we thank you for your goodness. And we thank you for your mercy. And Lord, for hearing us when we call and for meeting our needs. And Lord, may we never kick you aside. May you be the centerpiece of all our lives today. And Lord, we do need you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be blessed. Have a good day.